أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإسماعيل وإدريس وذا الكفل كل من الصابرين وأدخلناهم في رحمتنا إنهم من الصالحين وذا النون إذ ذهب مغاضبا فظن أن لن نقدر عليه فنادى في الظلمات أن لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين فاستجبنا له ونجيناه من الغم وكذلك ننجي المؤمنين وزكريا إذ نادى ربه رب لا تذرني فردا وأنت خير الوارثين فاستجبنا له ووهبنا له يحيى وأصلحنا له زوجه إنهم كانوا يسارعون في الخيرات ويدعوننا رغبا ورهبا وكانوا لنا خاشعين والتي أحصنت فرجها فنفخنا فيها من روحنا وجعلناها وابنها آية للعالمين صدق الله العظيم As this surah is known as surah al-anbiya where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about different anbiya alayhim as-salatu wassalam In the previous sessions we talked about some of the ayahs that talked about anbiya alayhim as-salatu wassalam and this is continuation of that the last Prophet that we talked about in the previous ayah that was Sayyidina Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam. Here in this ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ayah number 85 of Surah Al-Anbiya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning three more Anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam together. Wa Ismaila wa Idrisa wa dhal kifl. Kullum min al-sabirin. Ismaila alayhi salatu wasalam. Idrisa alayhi salatu wasalam. And Dhul Kifl alayhi salatu wassalam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, all of them were, were very patient. In the previous ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about the patience of Sayyidina Ayyub alayhi salatu wassalam. That he was, a very, he was very patient and we talked in detail about some of the hardships Sayyidina Ayyub alayhi salatu wassalam went through. And how he was very patient and in fact thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the blessings that he was receiving from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, yes, he was very patient and, but he was not the only person. All the Anbiya alayhi salatu was salam are like that. Ismail alayhi salatu was salam, Idris alayhi salatu was salam, Dhul Kifil alayhi salatu was salam. All the Anbiya alayhi salatu was salam were very patient. Simply means all the Anbiya alayhi salatu wassalam and these Anbiya alayhi salatu wassalam went through a lot of hardships and difficulties. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they all were very sabirin, they were very patient, simply means that these Anbiya alayhi salatu wassalam went through a lot of difficulties, they went through a lot of hardships, but they never complained. And this is the lesson that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us that if we are practicing the deen, we should not think that because of, um, because of practicing the deen, I should not face any difficulty. I should be always uh, immune against every difficulty and uh, difficulty proof uh, person because I do my salah regularly and because I'm doing my ibadah. No, this is not the case. In fact, as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Anbiya alayhi salatu wa sallam face the most difficulties. So, these difficulties are part of the life and then especially when we look at these Anbiya alayhi salatu wassalam you would normally find that all of these Anbiya alayhi salatu wassalam they never disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they were living a pure life a very clean life and a life of a true servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if anyone fulfilled the purpose of existence in this world of coming to this world those were Anbiya alayhi salatu was salam and no one did it better than Anbiya alayhi salatu was salam. So if really anyone deserved to live in this world, those were Anbiya alayhi salatu was salam. And people told Anbiya alayhi salatu was salam that we don't think you should live with us. We don't think you should live in our town. Well, please leave our town. Uh, otherwise we will kill you. And they killed many of the Anbiya alayhi salatu was salam. So we can see that people who deserve the most to live in this world and they were fulfilling the purpose of their existence and existence of human beings in the world those were the people that were accused by their people that you don't deserve to live here and we will not allow you to live here this is for us to understand that 
if a person will start getting disappointed by hearing statements from people that these people said this about me yes they can say anything else but I never expected they would say this about me the thing that you expect the least will be said the most about you and this is the accusation really stands for that that the thing that you don't do that is the thing that people would like to say about you so that they will hurt your feeling so that they will uh, find an excuse for not, uh, for uh, uh, for getting you out of the, the place for uh, keeping you away from them whatever they would like to do and whatever they like to achieve uh, the best thing is to accuse the person of something that he doesn't do and this is why Whenever a person would do something good amongst those who are doing bad. If a person is living in a society that is full of corruption, if this person would do something good, for sure he will be accused of doing wrong things. He will be accused. And if a person, is see, if, if a, if a person sees himself not being accused by others of doing something wrong, simply means you may not be doing good things. This is why when one of the scholars was informed that People, uh, people don't talk to. Uh, we didn't hear people talking bad about you. All the people admire you. He says this means something wrong now for me. Because if you do something good, then there will always be people that will come after you. Yes, if you do haram, you keep on doing wrong, keep on getting into the maasi, disobedience of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Everyone will be quiet. As soon as you would start doing something good. That's the time when everyone will start pointing fingers towards you. So, mainly this was the type of hardships that all the Anbiya went through. If you see the hardships that Rasulullah went through, these were most of the difficulties he faced that people are coming with false accusation about Rasulullah But Anbiya they were very patient. They always practiced sabr and they always uh, dealt with it in a very in the very beautiful way as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it's fabulous he asked and whenever an evil came to them they would not add evil to evil they would try to stop the evil by good deeds by good behaviors and in a good way so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that Anbiya alayhi salatu wa salam went through these difficulties hardships Ismail, Idris, Zalkibl, kullum min as-sabirin we all know Ismail alayhi salatu wa salam the son of Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam and no need to go into the details of his uh, uh, life history and we also hear the name in Quran of Idris alayhi salatu wa salam and I'm sure some of us must have some knowledge about a little bit at least background of Sayyidina Idris alayhi salatu wa salam but Dhul-Kifl who was Dhul-Kifl? This is a name that is mentioned only two times in Quran and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never mentioned any details about Dhul-Kifl alayhi salatu wa salam because of some ahadith that talk about a person who was named Al-Kifl and another person named Dhul Kifl, some Mufassirin are of the opinion that Dhul Kifl was not a prophet. Dhul Kifl was a very virtuous man. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned him here with these Anbiya alayhi salatu was salam because he was very virtuous and he was a great person. But majority of the Mufassirin are of the opinion no. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned him amongst Anbiya alayhi salatu was salam and he was one of the Anbiya alayhi salatu was salam. Then the second difference that is between the Mufassirin is that if he was a prophet of Allah, then what was his real name? Dhul Kifl doesn't look like a name, it means it sounds like a nickname. So what was his real name? So some said he was Al Ilyas alayhi salatu was salam's nickname was Dhul Kifl. Some say Al Yasa alayhi salatu was salam's uh, nickname was uh, Dhul Kifl. And there are many other opinions about it. So we don't know exactly what was his real name. All we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in two places in Quran al Kareem he mentions him amongst the prophets and Anbiya alayhi salatu was salam. So he must be a prophet. Of course, the confusion comes because of some ahadith talk about a person with the name Dhul Kufil and the thing that is mentioned about that person 
indicates that that person was not a prophet. But it's not necessary that the person that is mentioned in the hadith as Dhul Kifl will be the same person that Quran refers to as Dhul Kifl. There could be more than one Dhul Kifl in the past and there must have been a lot of Dhul Kifl. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned in the hadith which is in Musnad Ahmad that there was a person in Bani Israel whose name was Al-Kifl. Now, in this hadith, it doesn't say Dhul Kifl. It says there was a person in Bani Israel whose name was Al-Kifl. That person was approached once by a woman who was looking for some loan. This person had the money and he was rich. So when she approached him, he offered her the money as a gift if she would accept to come at zina with him. So of course because of her situation and she was in such a difficult situation that she accepted that. When they both were together, she was shivering and started crying. He asked her, what's wrong? She says, I have never committed this sin in my life. I'm afraid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he heard it, he said, keep the money. And I don't want to commit no haram. If you're afraid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why shouldn't I be afraid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And I really deserve more to be obedient to Allah and be afraid of Him. He has given me so much. And by helping others and I can help others and still I'm trying to commit sins and haram. So he repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the very same night he died. He died the same very same night. In the morning people saw there was a very special writing on his door not a common writing with the ink that they would have in those days. It was a type of writing where you can see that it's written in light. It's written with some light on the door, says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forgiven all the sins of al kifl and He has granted him the Jannah. The Sahabi who narrates the hadith says, I heard the very same story from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam more than six times that he narrated this hadith to us. So, because of this now, one thing that we learn from the hadith is, we should give up the sins as soon as we can. Who knows when the person would leave? Subhanallah, it was that night that he gave up the sin and the same night he died. Imagine if he had committed the sin and died. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written the hidayah for him and he had the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his heart as soon as he was reminded that said, he accepted the reminder, he repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and as he died the same night, he was forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This was one thing that we learned from the hadith, but the other thing that we learned from the hadith, that this person, Al-Kifl, was about to commit zina wa layazu billah, and Anbiya alayhi salatu was salam, they don't even get close to it. So, this person, Al-Kifl, could not be a prophet. But at the same time, this hadith tells us clearly that this could not have been a prophet because this person was committing sin and just the last night before he died, he repented, which means he never did any uh, 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 da'wah to the people. He never went out inviting people. So the, he never did the works of Anbiya alayhi salatu was salam. So he was not a prophet of Allah. Some other hadith talk in some different way about Dhul Kifl now. See this hadith talked about Al Kifl and as I said this person has to be something someone totally different than the one that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about in Quran as a person with the name called Dhul Kifl. As far as Dhul Kifl is concerned there is hadith talks about Dhul Kifl also and that is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said there was a person whose name was, uh, there was a prophet of Allah whose name was Al-Yasa. Al-Yasa alayhi salatu was salam when he got old, he said to his people upon receiving a message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I'm going to appoint a person, assign a person to be, to do this work, to, to carry my work after me. But I need a person who can fulfill three conditions. Number one, 
that person has to be has to be qaimul layl always doing ibadah throughout the night number 2 saimud dahr he has to be a person who fast every day of his life number 3 he has to be a person who doesn't get angry his sabr is very patient he doesn't get angry three conditions and Aliyasa alayhi salatu wassalam said that I know there may not be any person who has been doing these things but I want someone who can guarantee who can promise he would take care of these things he would have these three habits in him and I will make him the successor after me he will be the person who would take care of these responsibilities after me and Aliyasa alayhi salam is the prophet of Allah So this person gets up and he says, I would do that. Only one person who was ready for doing that type of work. Second day he asked again and again the very same person gets up. Third day he asked and the very same person gets up and he says, I would do it. So Aliyasa alayhi salatu wassalam gives him the responsibility. And he wants him to take over all of his responsibilities as he's getting too old. This person started fasting and staying up for a whole night. So he would sleep only for a short while in the afternoon. Shaitan realized that there is only one person who can do this work and who is taken this responsibility. So of course now his whole effort is on that person. This is something that where we have to pause for a minute and remind ourselves that whenever you start doing something good, shaitan will put his, more, his full effort towards you to take you away from it. And especially when there is fitna all around and there are only very few people who would like to do the right thing, then shaitan is going to try his best. Whatever he can, he would do it to get you away from what you're supposed to do. So now he sees that there is this one person only. If I can get this person out of this position, no one would be there to take this position. So, Shaitan lets him do it for some time. After that, one day he knows now, Dhul Kifil has some rest, he takes some rest in the afternoon, which in Arabic language is called Qaylula. So, he takes some rest in the afternoon and doesn't sleep for the whole night and he promised he won't. So in the afternoon, when it's time for Dhul Kifil to sleep, Shaitan goes and he knocks at the door. Someone came to answer the door and asked him, what do you need? He's in a form of an old man. He says, I have, people have done so much wrong to me, I really need to talk to him and I have to talk to him right now. So, of course, when he heard that there is a person who's Muslim, you know, is oppressed, uh, uh, and especially an old man, he came all the way here to talk to me. I can't just refuse to talk to him. So he calls him in. And Shaitan goes in and intentionally keep on prolonging a story that, you know, a person did this to me, then there was another person who did this to me. And he takes up all of that time, that was the time for Zul Kifil to have rest. Now, he didn't get no rest during the daytime and he cannot sleep during the night time. So he tries to go to... So at the end, Dhul Kifil says to him, Okay, tomorrow in the morning, I have a time set for, uh, where, uh, for, for the judgments and which we call it, uh, we may say that is the time where I sit in the court. So you come to me at that time and then we will deal with those people. Now, he managed to stay up at night time, he did his ibadah. Next day he's waiting that that old man is going to come and I'm going to help him. No one, that, that person never came. 
Next day, it's time for rest in the afternoon. The same person comes and he knocks at the door again. So they open the door for him. What do you need today? He says, I need to talk to him. Very urgent. Something very important. I have to talk to him now. So he calls him in. He says, I was waiting for you in the morning. He says, yes, when we went in the court, at the morning, in the morning, all of those guys were telling me that, okay, they will give me my rights and uh, there is no need to go to the court. And as soon as the time for the court was over and the court was closed, they said to me, no, we are not giving it to you. So here I am now. And now he starts up his story again. And he keeps on going on and on with his story. Abdul Kifil is not supposed to get angry. So he's not getting angry. He's having summer with him. So, Shaitan takes up all of that time. Again, Dhul Kifil says to him, come to me tomorrow in the morning when I'm in the court and we will settle everything for you. He never came into the court and third day he comes back. Dhul Kifil said to his people, today don't let this person come in. He assigned someone outside that don't let him even knock at the door. So he came. He wants to knock at the door, they don't let him knock. He wants to get in, they don't let him in. So he goes in somehow, of course, shaitan. Shaitan, you know, in the, he has his different ways now. If he changes his form, he can go in. So he goes in and he gets into the room and then he changes his form. So the Kifil knew that he cannot be just a normal person. My people didn't allow him in from there. So he came in. Simply, this has to be shaitan. So he says to him, the first thing he asked him, what do you need? And he started with the story, he says, I know you are shaitan. <coughs> and I know you are making up this story, and I know why you are doing this too. And that is, to get me angry. If I didn't sleep for two days, and third day you are going to come back and with the same story, and repeating the same story over and over, you, would, you expect me to get angry, and if I get angry, then of course I will lose this position. So I know this is what you're doing, but I'm just asking you that kindly that you just leave. So Shaitan says, this was my door to you, anger. I knew that if I could get to you by any way, this would be the easiest door to me for, to get to you, but I, didn't get, you know, I wasn't able to get to you. Now I'm sure that I will never be able to get to you again. So from this hadith, of course, if if this is a narration from Israeliyat or if this is a hadith, uh, whatever it is, what we learn from this is Zal Kifil was a person assigned by Al Yasa alayhi salatu wasalam, so he was not a messenger of Allah. Again, I would say this Zal Kifil doesn't have to be the same Zal Kifil that this ayah or the other ayah of Quran talks about. So, in the ayahs of Al Quran, the way the ayahs of the Qur'an talk about Dhul Kifil, they put him in the list of Anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam and they mention his name with Anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam. And in the ahadith, two, the ahadith talk about two different people. One is Al Kifil, the other is Dhul Kifil. And the way ahadith talk about Al Kifil and Dhul Kifil, it seems that that person was not a messenger of Allah. In fact, in one of the occasions, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, Dhul Kifil kana rajulan salihan. Dhul Kifil was a virtuous man from Bani Israel. So this shows that Dhul Kifil was not a prophet. Otherwise, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam would have clearly mentioned that he was a messenger of Allah instead of saying that he was a virtuous man. So there, are, these are different Dhul Kifil. The one that Quran talks about is a prophet of Allah. But which of the prophets? At what time did he come? Wallahu alam. The Israeliyat, which means the narrations that comes to us from Bani Israel. And especially when you look at the Old Testament, there is a chapter or there is a book in there of Hizqail. Hizqail is a person that many people think may have been Dhul Kifil. When you read the story of Hizqail, it seems that a person who went through a lot of difficulties and was very patient, had a lot of sabr, so was a good person. In fact, one thing, 
we have to admit that when you read Hizqail in the Bible, you can see that, yes, these are some words that seems that it may have been a story of a Prophet of Allah. Not necessarily revealed to, but of a Prophet of Allah, where there was a really a person who was very repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he was a virtuous person, and he was always doing the best he can in the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just the same concept that we have of Anbiya alayhi wa salatu wa salam. You will get it when you read this chapter of the Bible. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about these Anbiya alayhi wa salatu wa salam, Ismail wa Idris wa dhal kifl, kullum min al-sabirin. وَأَدْخَلْنَاهُمْ فِي رَحْمَتِنَا We admitted all of them into our mercy. إِنَّهُمْ مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ Surely they were very righteous people. So again, another reminder, as it was in the previous ayahs, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, when you are of a salihin, you will get into the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So salihin get the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And depending on the salah, how much salah we have, how many, how much good deeds we try to perform and how good we try to be in our deen, accordingly the person gets the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَذَنُّونِ إِذْ ذَهَبَ مُغَاضِبًا فَظَنَّ أَلَّا نَقْدِرَ عَلَيْهِ and the noon, the man of the fish. Noon in Arabic language means fish. The noon, the person of the fish. When he walked away in anger. I will stop at this point. Let us look at the first parts of the ayah. Then inshallah we will look at this third portion of the ayah. The noon, again, as I said, it's, it, means to, uh, it means that a person of the fish refers to Sayyidina Yunus alayhi salatu was salam. We all know that Yunus alayhi salatu was salam was swallowed by a fish. And therefore, he's called the noon. In another ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in Surah Al-Qalam, he says, وَلَا تَكُنْ كَصَاحِبِ الحوت. Don't be like the person of the fish. The word hut is used over there. Noon is used over there, both of them means fish. When he walked away in anger, he was angry with who? Some people thought that he was angry with Allah and he walked away. Where is he going to go away if he's angry from Allah with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I mean, if a person feels that if I leave this city, I'm going away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I go out to the other city, then their Allah is not there. Of course, no believer would think about it, forget about the Prophet of Allah thinking about it that way. So, he walked away in anger. In anger from his people. He was angry with his people who were continuously disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just like Nuh alayhi salatu was salam made dua against his people. Rabbi la tadhar ala al-ardi min al-kafirina dayyara. Ya Allah, don't leave a single house of non-believers on this land. Musa alayhi salatu was salam was angry with Qarun. He was angry with Fir'aun. He made dua against them. And Anbiya alayhi salatu was salam made dua against the disbelievers of those times. So Sayyidina Yunus alayhi salatu was salam, he also made dua, and he was upset with his people. This, these words can have two different meanings. Let me tell you the wrong meaning first, and then I will tell you the right meaning. And the reason I want to tell you the wrong meaning first, because many of the translators thought that this is the meaning of it. Zanna in Arabic language means to think. Now, normal Arabic speaking person who has little bit understanding of the language would take the word as, as if it means that he thought we will not have any power over him. This is what it means. We have no qudra over him. We have no power over him. Once Sayyidina Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, 
was reciting these ayahs of Quran al kareem and as he came to this ayah of Surah Al-Anbiya, he started shaking. What does it mean? Can a Prophet of Allah ever think that Allah has no power over him? Right away, he writes a letter to Mufassir Al-Quran, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. And he says to him, he wrote a beautiful letter that means that while I was going deep in the oceans of the Quran and trying to get the pearls from the depth of it, this is how they used to recite Quran, that with understanding and they're trying to get whatever meanings they can get from the depth of the ayahs of the Quran. So he says, I was in the depth of the ocean of the Quran and I'm picking up the different type of pearls from there. A big wave came and it was about to take me away and I was about to be droned, but I stopped right away. I was able to control myself and this is when I'm writing this letter to you. And that wave was this ayah when it says, I know that I'm not understanding the right meaning of it. What does this ayah mean? I know for sure a Prophet of Allah will never think Allah has no qudra over him. Allah has no power over him. So Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu wrote back to Muawiyah radiallahu anhu that this qudra does not refer, this qadra does not refer to the qudra, power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is another word in Arabic language same root word qadara yaqdiru and is used in Quran also for another meaning which means to make it difficult or on someone as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَمَنْ قُدِرَ عَلَيْهِ رِزْقُهُ فَلْيُنْفِقْ مِمَّا أَتَاهُ اللَّهِ a person whose risk have been coming, has been becoming very difficult on him very narrow on him so qudira alayhi rizqu Risk is getting very difficult. So, He knew we will not make it difficult on him. And now when he knew that, now the next part of the ayah will make every sense, and that is, فَنَادَى فِي الظُّلُمَاتِ Then in the darknesses, he started calling us. Otherwise, if he thinks Allah has no power over him, why would he call Allah? But he called Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only because he knew Allah will not make it difficult on him. He knew we will not make it difficult on him. Same word Qudra, just for us to remember the meaning of it, is used in Surah Al-Talaq also. وَمَنْ قُدِرَ عَلَيْهِ رِزْقُهُ فَلْيُنْفِقْ مِمَّا آتَاهُ اللَّهِ And there is another ayah. There are some other ayahs also that use the same, very same word, qadara, which means making things difficult, things becoming difficult on the person. So this is what this word is used for in this ayah, that Yunus alayhi salatu wasalam knew Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not make it difficult on him. فَنَادَى فِي الظُّلُمَاتِ Then he called Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But before we go to the dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that Yunus alayhi salatu was salam, he left his people and he was very angry with his people. Then he knew that we are not going to make it difficult on him. Why does he have to think that way? I mean, what makes him think that Allah is not going to make it difficult on me? He left his people because he was angry with his people. They are not doing the ibadah of Allah. So why Allah would ever make it difficult on him now? As we learn in the light of other ayahs and the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that Sayyidina Yunus alayhi salatu wa salam, he invited his people who were more than 100,000 people in his community, in his town. وَأَرْسَلْنَاهُ إِلَىٰ مِئَةِ أَلْفٍ أَوْ يَزِيدُونَ We sent him to more than 100,000 people. He kept on inviting them, and of course, he got the same response as 
other Anbiya alayhim salatu was salam got from their people. Sayyidina Yunus alayhi salatu was salam, after a long time, as he knew that these people are not going to listen, they are not willing to understand, they don't want to accept the Hidayah, so he made dua against them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed him that the, this nation will be punished soon and the sign of the punishment were also given to Sayyidina Yunus alayhi salatu wasalam that when you see these signs means the, punish, the punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is coming soon. And then he was given some signs that when you see these signs within three days from seeing these signs the adab will come. Yunus alayhi salatu wasalam informed people that if you don't repent, you still have an opportunity, you must repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Otherwise the adab will come. Allah has promised me that He's going to send the adab to you people if you don't if you don't won't obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But those people did not want to listen. Finally, he saw the signs about which he was informed that after you see these signs, three days from this these signs, the adab will come. Sayyidina Yunus alayhi salatu was salam. When he saw these signs, he thought it's time for him to leave this town. Because now within three days the adab will come. And it's Allah's rule, when the adab comes, then it never goes away. After seeing the adab, then the adab doesn't, doesn't go away. So, the signs of the adab are here. I better leave. There is no sense in living among these people anymore. And Yunus alayhi salatu was salam leaves the town. Inshallah we'll continue after the salah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu was salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya wa al-mursaleen wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa azwadihi. Wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsanin ila yawm al-deen. Sayyidina Yunus alayhi salatu was salam. After seeing the signs of the adab, he left the town thinking that it's time for him to leave now and no sense for him to live over there anymore with those people. But that was a mistake because Anbiya alayhi salatu was salam, they are not supposed to take any step in their lives without getting a permission from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yunus alayhi salatu was salam didn't realize that he was making that mistake. Remember, is not a sin. There is a difference between sin and a mistake. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never told Yunus alayhi salatu was salam not to leave. If he had received the order earlier not to leave and then he had left, of course, then we would say that this would be a sin. But it's not that Allah told him not to leave and he left. It was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never told him anything. He thought upon seeing the signs of adab, I should leave and he left. Did not wait until he gets that specific order for him to leave. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, فَاصْبِرْ لِحُكْمِ رَبِّكَ Wait for the order of your Lord. وَلَا تَكُنْ كَصَاحِبِ الْحُوتِ Don't be like the one of the fish, like the man of the fish. So, this is what, this was the mistake. That did not wait for the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to leave, he left earlier. This is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he received the order for hijrah, Initially, it was a permission for people to go for, uh, to do the hijrah to Medina Munawwara. And he told Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een, Inni uritu dara hijratikum. I have been shown the place of your hijrah. But he did not leave himself until Allah told him specifically that now you should leave too. So the rest of the Sahaba were leaving until Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa received the order himself to leave and then he left and he did the hijrah. Yunus alayhi salatu was salam, as he left the town, he wanted to cross the ocean. And over there, he finds the boat. People knew that this is a good man, this is a virtuous man. They, get him, they, gave, they gave him a free ride. Somewhere along this ride in the middle of the ocean, they started having some heavy waves. One started blowing hard. According to their understanding, they thought there must be someone here a slave who have run away from his master. And we have to throw one person out. Now, there are two reasons in the narrations mentioned for throwing a person out. Either 
the thing is too heavy and one person has to be out. But this doesn't really make that much sense as much as the other Persian part of it, and that is the other narration, and that is there is a slave who has been run away for running away from his master, and that slave has to come out of this boat. Otherwise, we all are going to be droned. How to determine who that person is? So that's that we are going to vote. Whoever's name is going to come out, that is the person who will have to be thrown out. So they started voting. Three times they voted, and each time Yunus alayhi salatu wasalam's name came up, that he is the person who has to be thrown out. And accordingly, they threw Yunus alayhi salatu wasalam in the ocean. And right there, there was a well waiting for Yunus alayhi salatu wasalam with the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it swallowed Sayyidina Yunus alayhi salatu wasalam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had ordered the well that this is not your food. You are only a different right for him now. So, he was swallowed by that well and remained in the well for some time. While he was in there, he realized that for me to leave without receiving the order of Allah wasn't good. And this might, might be the reason I ended up in this situation. And then I'm not even receiving any orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, anything, any, any new revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It may be that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is upset with me because of this. When he realized that that was a mistake, I should have waited to get the order of Allah. So he started praying. Allah ilaha illa anta subhanak inni kuntu min al-zalimeen Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in another ayah of Quran falawla annahu kana min al-musabbihin if Yunus alayhi salatu was salam was not of those who were praying who, who used to praise me la labitha fi batnihi ila yawmi yub'athun i would have kept him in the stomach of that well till the day of judgment what does it mean falawla annahu kana min al-musabbihin if he was not of those who used to do my tasbih, who used to praise me, many of the Mufassirin say that Yunus alayhi salatu was salam, with the work of the da'wah that he was doing in his people, he used to, he was of, of the habit of praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a lot. Always his tongue used to be busy in praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, subhanallah, 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 wa bihamdi, whichever form he would use. Wallahu alam. So, because of those deeds that he was performing earlier when he was doing the work in his nation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through those deeds saved him at this time and he gave him the tawfiq to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through this dua, La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al-zalimeen. This is a reminder that we should always have the habit of doing the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at a time of ease. Don't wait until we get into difficulty and then we start doing everything. The ibadah performed at the time of ease helps the person in the time of difficulties. Yunus alayhi salatu wasalam's tasbih that he was doing when he was earlier, before he got into this situation, because of his habit of always being busy in the tasbih of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, through that I saved him when he was there. It was the blessing of that, it was the effect of that tasbih that he used to praise me at that time. And we read in the hadith the story of three people who were traveling and started raining the one into a cave and a big rock came that blocked the entrance of the cave. Very well known hadith. So they said to each other, there is no way we can get out of this situation. The rock is too heavy for us to push it out. The only thing we can do is make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through some of our good deeds. And each of them made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, mentioning one of his deed that he did it only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with ikhlas, with sincerity, and it was a good deed that he could have taken advantage of it and did something wrong, but instead of that, he decided to do something good for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Through that dua, 
and each person as he made the dua, the rock moved a little. First person made the dua, moved a little bit, but not enough for them to come out. But at least some air now, some light is coming in. Second person makes the dua, moves a little more. Third person makes the dua, it just falls down. This is to tell us that this is the time for us to do whatever we need to do. So that in a time of difficulty, these rocks will move out of our ways through that dua. In the dua, a person can bring the wasila of the a'mal salihah of good deeds, Ya Allah. On that day, I did this, and you know I did it only for your sake. Ya Allah, in that, at that situation, I did this work only for your sake. And if you know that I did it for your sake, then Ya Allah, help me in this situation. And Allah witness over everything. He knows what was our intention at the time of doing those deeds. It wasn't to get any reward from Allah in this world. But now at a time when the time comes, yes, they will help you also in this world. So the good deeds performed at a time of ease. Those are real deeds. Those are the things, the deeds that really help the person in a time, at a time of difficulties and the time of hardships. There are some narrations that say when Yunus alayhi salatu was salam started praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the stomach of that well, La ilaha illa anta subhanak. Angels heard it. They said, Ya Allah, this sounds very familiar. The voice sounds very familiar. But we don't know, we can't recognize the person. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed them that this is Yunus alayhi salatu was salam. They used to hear his voice every day, but today is coming from all the way from the depth of the ocean. So they could not recognize it. Here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs them, this is Yunus alayhi salam, the person who is of al-musabbihin, of course, who is always doing the tasbih of Allah. Angels always are hearing the tasbih of Yunus alayhi salatu salam. They are used to hearing the tasbih from Yunus alayhi salatu salam. So now they pray, they pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they intercede on behalf of Yunus alayhi salam. Ya Allah, save him from that situation. We remember his tasbih, we remember his ibadah, save him from that situation. So Yunus alayhi salatu salam made this dua, La ilaha illa anta subhanak, inni kuntu min al-zalimeen. And he admits that I'm a wrongdoer. I'm the wrongdoer. Of course, this is the situation with Anbiya alayhi salatu was salam and even the true believers they never blame Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for anything and of course how can the blame go to him wal billah la ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al-zalimin Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says fastajabna lah we responded to him wanajaynahu min al-gham and we rescued him from the distress and the hardship that he was in wa kadhalika nunjil mu'mineen Allah tells us now, I'm making a general rule. I saved Yunus alayhi salatu salam through the prayers. And وَكَذَلِكَ نُنْجِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ this is, we, this is how we save the believers too. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith, if a person who is having difficulties will recite this dua, لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنْتَ سُبْحَانَكَ إِنِّي كُنْتُ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ Surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make that difficulty easy for him and will make an, a way for him out of that situation. لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين And as Allah promising us وكذلك ننجي المؤمنين This is how we always save the believers. وزكريا إذ نادى ربا ربي لا تذرني فردا وأنت خير الوارثين And remember زكريا عليه الصلاة والسلام when he called his Lord, Rabbi la tadarni farda, O my Lord, do not leave me alone, all by myself. Wa anta khayrul warisin, and you are the best of inheritors. Fastajabna lam, we accepted his prayer. Wa wahabna lahu yahya, we gave him a yahya as a gift. Wahab, we gave it to him as a gift. Yeah, gave him yahya alayhi salam as a gift. وَأَصْلَحْنَا لَهُ زَوْجَهُ And we cured his wife for him. إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا يُسَارِعُونَ فِي الْخَيْرَاتِ They used to race towards the good deeds. وَيَدْعُونَنَا رَغَبًا وَرَهَبًا And they used to call us with hope and fear. وَكَانُوا لَنَا عَابِدِينَ And they were very humble to us. 
look at the qualities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning of these people. And this is, of course, these are the qualities of all of these Anbiya alayhim salatu wassalam that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mentioned in these ayahs. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Zakariya alayhi salatu wassalam prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He did not have no children. So he made dua, but of course, now he's in his old age. Rabbi inni qad wahan al azmu minni wa ishta'ala al ra'su shayba. Ya Allah, my bones have, are getting too weak now. And the old age have spread in my head, which means it's all white, gray hairs. But, walam akum bi du'aika rabbi shaqiyya. When I pray to you, Ya Allah, I never come back empty handed. I never get rejected. And he made this dua specifically, he's making the dua at the time when he went to Maryam alayhi salatu wasalam because he was the caretaker of Maryam alayhi salatu wasalam and he was her uncle too. And he sees some fruit over there. He sees some food over there. He knows that I didn't bring her this. And the door is locked. No one else can get in. Where did she get this from? قَالَ يَا مَرْيَمُ أَنَّا لَكِ هَذَا He asked, Maryam, where did you get this from? She said, هُوَ مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ It is from Allah. Fruit out of season. You don't get that fruit in the season. This is not the time for us to get this fruit in this time, in this time of the year. Right away it came to his mind that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give fruit out of season, He can give children out of season too. <laughs> I'm old, my wife is old, we, she, is, she cannot give birth to children, she never had child, we never had a child. But what does that mean? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, here he's giving this fruit, he can give something else too. So right away he repents to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and makes dua. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ We accepted his dua. But as I mentioned that ayah, let me quickly mention a point of interest in that ayah, that when he went and he... So that fruit and that food with Maryam alayhi salatu wasalam, he asked, Anna laki hadha, where did you get this from? To tell us that you go home, you find something that, don't think that I brought this thing to home. I never bought something like this. But children are playing with it, children are having it. Anna laki hadha, where did you get it from? We need to know. Yahya alayhi, Zakariya alayhi salatu wasalam, didn't just let it go, that it might be from Allah, okay? No. Where did you get it from? I have to know. I'm in charge of the situation. So, to make sure whatever our children are using, it's theirs. They are not taking people's things. They are not stealing. They are not getting from haram. They are not getting it from wrong sources. Whenever we see something, where did you get this from? It's something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us in Quran. So, Zakariya alayhi salatu was salam made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted his dua and not only that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted him a son he gave him a great blessing and that was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself named that son for him he named him Yahya see we feel very great that that scholar named me or named my child I asked that scholar what should be the name of the child and he, he gave this name to my child. And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving that name. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in another ayah of Quran al-Kareem that that was a name that was not given to any person before. It was a unique name that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave it to Sayyidina Yahya alayhi salatu wasalam. And he told Sayyidina Zakariya alayhi salam that she would have a son and his name would be Yahya. Which, in the name itself, it has a good news for Zakariya alayhi salatu wasalam. Yahya means he would live. So it was a news that your son is going to have a good long life. وَأَصْلَحْنَا لَهُ زَوْجَهُ And we cured his wife. إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا All of these Anbiya. Now this is not referring to just Yahya alayhi salatu wasalam or just uh, Zakariya alayhi salam and his wife. It is referring to them and rest of the Anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam. 
إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا يُسَارِعُونَ فِي الْخَيْرَاتِ Look at the qualities that Allah loves to see in human beings, in His true servants. يُسَارِعُونَ فِي الْخَيْرَاتِ They used to race towards the good deeds. مُسَابَقَةَ إِلَى الْخَيْرَاتِ To compete with each other in doing the good things. This is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een. This was the habit that was developed amongst Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een that they used to raise each other in doing the good deeds. Without trying to hurt each other, in good way, they are racing each other. And this is of course one of the best ways we know if you want children to really be successful in something, get them to be in competition with some other intelligent children who are good in his studies. Okay, now you uh, compete with him. See if you, uh, this is what all the exams are for. Everywhere in schools, universities, colleges, wherever you go, there are exams. What does these exams mean? It's basically competition. Making the ones who don't study at all, at least make them study so that they won't fail, they are afraid of failing. The worst students who really don't care about the studies, at least at the time of exams, they are afraid of failing. And the good ones, they really would like to compete with each other in trying to have higher marks than others. So this is human nature. And it's not only amongst children, it's in adults too. When there is competition, then you try to have a better performance. If you play with a ball, and you run with the ball by yourself, of course, you will be running to a certain pace. But say if you find out that someone is running after you to get the ball from you. Now there is a competition, and see how fast you will run now. This is human nature. إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا يُسَارِعُونَ Musara'a is human nature, to compete. And when there is competition, to try to be ahead of others. But the good thing would be to use this quality of musara'a, of competition, in khairat. In doing the good deeds. And instead of competition, in trying to look better, trying to drive a better car, holding a better cell phone, having a better house. Our competitions are normally in these type of things, which is of course uh, something that we all know, and uh, very widely spread disease, that okay, if he had this one tomorrow, I'm going to be holding another cell phone, and even if it won't ring, I'll make sure I pick it up. <laughs> so everyone knows that, you know, this is the phone I have. If you see someone looking at the watch every five minutes, means he must have bought a new watch. And he wants people to notice, you know, this is a new one. This is not the same old one that I have for the last 10 years. Completion here, been, it is in human nature, but Musara'a ila al-khayrat. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may sahaba ridwanullahi alayhi wa jama'een, always have this habit of having Musara'a ila al-khayrat. Say, look, look at the simple example, the hadith, that talks about coming towards the Jum'ah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, فَالْمُهَجَّرْ كَالَّذِي يُهْدِي بَدَنَا the person who would come first to Salatul Jum'ah is like a person who has given a camel, offered a camel as a sacrifice to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Today me and you cannot offer a camel as a sacrifice. But can't we come early for Jum'ah to get that reward of offering the camel as a sacrifice? Every Jum'ah we have that opportunity. It's only if we grab it. And hearing this, we all know the situation of Sahaba Ridwanullah Ali Majma'een. That situation was such that there was no need even to call the first Azan at that time. As the Azan is being called for Jum'ah, the Jum'ah is full, no one comes after the first, after this Azan. After Azan, right after Azan, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam started the khutbah. There is no need to call Azan earlier, because they come before the time of Zawal, before the time of Zawal the start, everyone is in the masjid. So uh, you can't call this uh, Azan before the time of the start. If you wait until the time I've started, they all are in the masjid. So there was no need to call that adhan. But later on, as people started getting lazy, now we may need a third adhan. <laughs> so, completion. This is where they used to, their musabaqa was in khairat, in doing the good deeds. For us, yes, we may also get 
before uh, others at certain places, but not in the masjid. In the gym, yes, I was the first. I, I was the first person here. I prepared everything here. Barbecue, yes, I'm the one who put it on. I set everything up here. In the masjid, maybe in the stuff that is outside of the masjid. So this is this is what we need to really work on. Innahum kanu yusari'una fil khayrat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us this for a reason. That this is a habit that Allah loves. He's admiring these great people by these few qualities. He just wanted to mention three qualities. Imagine, take Anbiya alayhimu salatu wassalam. All the great prophets of Allah. And then if I would tell you that tell me three great qualities of these prophets of Allah. What would be those three that you would mention? Here Allah tells us, He says, you don't have to go into those things. You won't be able to do it. We would all fail. But Allah says, and out of these qualities, the first one is, إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا يُسَارِعُونَ فِي الْخَيْرَاتِ They used to haste, they used to race each other, they used to compete with each other in doing the good deeds. And we know the hadith of Umar radiallahu anhu, at the time of the battle of Tabuk, he says, today I'm going to give a charity more than Abu Bakr. If I will, I'm going to compete with Abu Bakr today and give more sadaqah than him. And he comes with half of his wealth. You know, it's not... It's not easy. It's not a joke to give half of your wealth. He comes with half of his wealth. And here Abu Bakr is standing in the line to give to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa asked him, What did you bring Abu Bakr? What did you leave for your family Abu Bakr? He says, I left Allah and his messenger's name. Which means he brought everything. Nothing is left at home. He brings all the pots, spades, spoons, whatever he has, anything. He just gathers everything from the house. The house is empty. Ya Rasulullah, take all of this. Innahum kanu yusari'una fil khayrat. This was the habit. They used to compete in doing the good deeds. And their hadiths are full of these examples. And if you look at the hadith where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam mentioned the virtues of the deeds, you will find that this is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam is trying to develop. The habit he's developed, trying to develop within the ummah, that fasaf, come and sit in the fasaf, come and call the adhan. These type of things when he mentions the reward and he tells us that if you know the importance of it, you will be warning for it. People will be fighting for getting it. So this is of course what he's trying to develop within us. But because we didn't give it no importance, so our competitions are not in this field, we our competitions are in other fields. We do compete with others. All of us we do. Look at our souls. When you go back, think about yourself seriously. What is it that you are trying to be better than others in? And there will be a list of things where we are try, really trying to look better than others in those things. Trying to prove ourselves that I'm better than others in doing these certain things. But mainly is that our musara has to be our competition, our race who has to be in al-khayrat. وَيَدْعُونَنَا رَغَبًا وَرَهَبًا Second quality that Allah loves of these Anbiya alayhi wa salatu salam and the virtuous people and the great people is that they used to pray to us with hope and fear. They always used to pray to me. And when they pray to me, they have a lot of hope from me. It's not that I'm going to reject them. And at the same time, they have a lot of fear from me that I, I have the right, I can reject them. And therefore, they continuously keep on praying to me. This fear, what the fear would do? will prevent the person from getting into wrong. And hope will encourage the person to do more and more of the good things. This is the third quality that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, that they were very humble before us. They were very humble before us, which means whenever the deen came before them, they humbled themselves. Okay, this is deen, I accept it. It's not, no, 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 no. I, I don't think it's like this. I'm going to find out, I'm going to do this. No. They were humbling themselves before us. So these are the beautiful qualities that Allah loves to see amongst human beings. And this is why He's mentioning it. And He's telling us these are some of the qualities that I loved from these Anbiya alayhi salatu wassalam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq to follow the steps of these Anbiya alayhi salatu wassalam. And may Allah give us these great qualities 
And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq to have all the qualities of as salihin and of the virtuous people and people that are loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa li sa'ir al-muslimin wa al-muslimat wa akhiru da'wana wa alhamdulillahi rabbi. If anyone has a question, please go ahead. How did they vote? The way the word is called Qur'a. Qur'a means you write the names and you put it in one bucket, for example, and you mix all the papers, and then you pull up the paper. Okay, whoever's name is going to come out, that is the person that will be thrown out. Mm -hmm. Was that used at all? We know that in the days of Jahiliyyah there was another method of it and that is they used to keep arrows with them. And normally they used to keep 10 arrows in a bag and some of the arrows will have yes on them, some of the arrows will have no on them. And the person will pull up the arrow thinking that okay, if, which means, Ya Allah, should I do this? And he will put the arrow. I pull the arrow out. If it says yes, yes, go ahead and do it. No, don't do it. Suraqa bin Malik, when he followed Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at the time of the hijrah, he says, I pulled one of my arrows to see should I follow him or I shouldn't. He pulled it out and the one that says no came out. So he says, no, no, let me mix it again. You know, 100 camels on the other side. So he mixed them up again and pulls another one out says no. No, let me try once again. He mixed them up, pulls it again, says no. He says forget it, you know, let me just do it this time. And they voted three times. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason for the vote three times? The reason that is mentioned in some of the narrations for voting three times is because uh, they knew that this man is virtuous man, he's a good man, so I mean, we don't think that he has run away from his master. So it, it's a mistake. Let us try. Someone else's name may come up. Is it? Does it mean that it is allowed in these days to draw names and not to throw people in the water for sure? But of course, to draw names, uh, uh, it depends. In the fara'il, in doing the deeds, or in giving people their rights. Okay, I owe you hundred dollars. Should I pay you back or not? Let me draw the ones, uh, the names out. You know, sure. that for that is not allowed. But say, for example, there is some equal right for all of us that we all are going to get something. Who should get it first at this time? For that to draw names out, it's okay because all of them are going to get it anyway. So in the situations where we want to deprive some people from their rights is not allowed. But it's only when who will have the preference to get it first and who will get it second for those type of things is allowed in the Sharia. Why was it assumed that somebody had ran away from their master? Sorry? What was, why was that, that the feeling that someone had run away from his master? Wallahu alam, it might have been that it's only a, a way that they used to have it, I mean, that this was their thinking of it, and not necessarily it was correct. But this is how they used to feel about uh, these situations. It was just their belief, just like different people we find uh, at different times, uh, they have many different beliefs that are, have nothing to do with reality, but it's only people's uh, uh, way of thinking about it.